What is going on, everybody? It's Josh Wilson, and I'm in the Big Dog Studio with my man Jonathan Mack. What's up, Jonathan? Nothing much. Just hanging out. Good to be back. Man, it is good to have you back. Um, we took a little break. It wasn't a planned break, and it's nobody's fault but my own. Just things were going on. Jonathan was out in California, as we mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, you know, working on some things. So um, I was like, ah. We'll let him work on some stuff. Meanwhile, Jonathan's like, can we get this podcast episode recorded? Yeah. <laughs> but such is life. Here we are. We're back together again. Yeah. It's all good. Everything is expensive in California. It's nice to be back. <laughs> it's $3 for a large fry just to let everyone know what the state of things is. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. $3 for a large fry. No, $3 for a small fry. Oh, shit. $3 for a small fry. And where's most- that at? McDonald's. <laughs> Yeah, three dollars for a small fry at McDonald's, and they have the audacity to just keep the small fry on the dollar menu. So it's like they have it there, but then you pull up to the window, and they're like three thirty, and you're like, I've been bamboozled. So California's dollar menu is actually three thirty. It's adjusted for inflation. Yes, <laughs> that, that Cali, that Cal inflation. That's what they call it. Calflation, Califlation. What do we want to call it? Something robbery. <laughs> yeah, <dude>. Rob- <laughs> yeah, theft. Sh- Strong armed robbery <laughs> is what that is. This is just theft. So you're rolling through, you think you're getting a dollar menu fry. Man, it might be a dollar, but those taxes in California are built different too. I my friend, my friend John is a good friend because he he decided not to back up. Cause I was like, no, back up. I need to see the menu. I know it was a dollar on the menu. They got you. He was like, nope, you're just gonna have to eat that three dollar small fry and learn <laughs> never to come out again. <laughs> they call it they call it the three dollar menu in yeah. California. That's funny. So you were in LA. Yep. All right. In the heart of it. Did you fly into LAX? Uh, yeah, I, I think LAX gets a bad rap because the Fort Lauderdale airport is who we should be focusing all of our, oh, towards. Miami, that I think all the airports in South Florida are absolute trash LAX. I've never actually really had any problems flying in and out of LAX. I've only had one crazy delay, but yeah. I blame like American airlines before I blame LAX there. Oh yeah. T- rarely is it the airport. You know what I mean? It's it's the airlines. But yeah, LAX, I mean, for the size of that airport, to me, it's kind of like Dallas, where the size of that airport, I'd never have any major issues. It, it's you know, crazy. There. How Miami, many people go through there? The chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Somebody was telling me, though, like Miami um, has the problems. Something about it's something to do with like how the weather like oh, fronts yeah. like work their way through. They just have the biggest excuse of all time to be like, we're not doing anything today. Well, the thing that's crazy is depending on where the front is like Miami, there aren't like a bunch of alternative routes for them to go. So they kind of just like, well, we're, we're yeah. here. I don't know if I told you, but uh, I flew spirit airlines and they left my bag in Fort Lauderdale. So now I have to drive back to back to Richmond just to go get my bag. Yeah, you told me that yesterday. I mean, I will tell you, though, there is. Um, I mean, I know it's a season of life and it's fine, but as soon as possible, the spirit season of life has to end. I don't know. what that it, is. It, it has to end. Like, I just I don't. One, I don't think it really ends up being cheaper once they get you for all the bags and like all no. this crap Two, there's no part of me that trusts getting on an airplane when my ticket's $89. I'm like, how are you? <laughs> as long as it's not a Cessna, I'm not, I'm not no. upset, but I have no. some, I have some theories. For $89, I want it to be a Cessna because at least the maintenance cost is alignment between me and my five friends. I'm never getting on a plane that they have to weigh me to get on. <laughs> never, never in my life. I, yeah, I mean, I've been on small planes. Um, it's definitely a different experience. How do you feel about turbulence? Um, I feel that I would prefer to not experience it. Really? I, I, enjoy, I enjoy it and, and because, I mean, flight in and of itself wouldn't be impressive without turbulence, would it? It's like the fact that we had to overcome that is crazy. So every time I feel it in the air, I'm like, damn, this is human engineering that it's keeping us up. I enjoy it. It makes me feel a little bit more human. Um, if <laughs> no, I, I, I would just prefer to not, I don't, I don't love it. I don't love it. I saw this one video where, I mean, I don't freak out. I used to freak out just at flight itself, like really get stressed out, hands sweating. I'm holding Devin's like knee. She's sitting next to me. I'm squeezing the armrest. People are like, is this joker? Okay. 
that that's how I used to be. I'm not that way anymore. But I've talked about that theory where I believe that um, certain sections of the plane, if something's happening, uh, the plane will split. Mm-hmm. by class and um, and there's another plane that will get you safely to where you're going that's why there's all that room that's what you're really paying for you're right. not paying for extra leg room you're paying for the escape pod in case shit hits the fan that's the thing though is I've, i'm a big fan of lost and anyone who's seen lost knows that like the tail end of the plane might be the might be the end to be on uh yes um it, it depends on the type of landing they're taking <laughs> the the emergency i guess but i've seen these videos where the turbulence is so bad the wing looks like it's doing the wave oh yeah and the engines shaking all over this place I'm like this thing's about to pop off of here so i don't know i'd prefer a smooth smooth flight i have been in the air when it has significantly like dropped from the turbulence um that that's pretty scary you think the end is coming um, I will tell you though, I would rather experience turbulence than a sudden flight path adjustment when you're just sitting there having your beverage, eating your pretzels, and all of a sudden the plane makes a hard right because somewhere there was an issue, wrong communication, yeah. and there was another flight in the pattern. Uh, this was, gosh, probably, I don't know. Ooh, um, we're probably looking like 20 years at this point that that happened, but that was terrifying. I was on a, a regional flight out of Newport news headed to New York and um, it's for like a 45 minute flight. That flight used to be great. It was Delta 45 minutes up and down, boom, straight into LaGuardia, maybe 50 minutes. I don't know. Just cruising along. And that flight was just long enough for when you get up in the air, they bring you a drink. They, by the time they're done at the end, they're coming back, picking them up because you're getting ready to land. We're cruising along. Pilot says nothing. There's nothing said. That plane just banks to the right. Terrifying. And sure as shit, there was a plane, which probably really far away, but close enough to cause immediate change in in plans. That to me was horrifying. Yeah. I mean, if you prepare me for it and I'm like, okay, we're about to do some fun shit in this plane. Cool. No, when you're just sipping your OJ and it banks to the right and the stewardess is screaming and all that stuff, when the, oh, I don't think you can say stewardess anymore. The flight attendant is hollering. If the flight attendant hollers, yeah, there's an issue. I also feel like if the flight attendant seriously buckles in and tightens the straps, you know that there's potentially some stuff. If, if they put the seatbelt light on and they're like, hey, we're going to have some turbulence, we're going to cut this seatbelt back on. And the, the flight attendants just kind of chilling, doing whatever. They go and sit down. No big deal. But when you see them strap in and pull the the extra tight, I'm sitting there looking at my little seatbelt like, wait a minute. They got a five-point harness. They're also yeah. sitting next to that door, though. Yeah, it's kind of rough. I mean, I'm a... Mm. I don't know. I'm I'm a terrible passenger when it comes to flights. Like I never, I don't put my seatbelt on. I'm like, I paid for this. You're not going to tell me how to ride on a plane. <laughs> um, I vape when they say put all the electric. Yeah, I vape on a plane. No, you don't. Yes. Jonathan. I pay for the flight. I'm going to so ride in. 500 other people. You can't vape on the plane. I don't blow it out. Like oh, that okay. All what right. do I look like? I'm civilized. I'm like, I was like, Jonathan, I know you're not sitting there. <sighs> No, no, I'm not. I'm not blowing O's so at people. Mad at you. I, no. I'd be so mad no, no, at that's you. not. That's an, I blow it into the sleeve, make sure nobody sees. But uh, I'm not. Uh, as the as the vapor goes. Up. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you just hit a little, <laughs> and the smoke comes up, and the flight attendant walks by. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's a. No, people will do some things on a plane, though. That's pretty funny. I nearly got into an argument with the lady because they held they held us on the runway. Because that's the most frustrating. Oh when you're yeah. You're about to take off. You get on a plane and then you sit in a runway. I think you've told the story oh, about yeah. that before of having Miami. to sit in the runway. Yep, in Miami, same same exact location. Sat in the runway and I needed to go to the restroom. And I'm like, I don't know how long we're about to be taxiing for. They're gonna leave the seatbelt sign on. I'm just going to get up while all these flight attendants are up front trying right, to figure yeah. out what's going on, hit the bathroom, sit back down. The lady next to me says, we're not allowed to get up. The seatbelt sign is on. All right, Karen. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting inside, like by the window. Right. Unless I want to knee this lady in the face, I can't get up. Right. Yeah. So I had to sit there and I sat there for 45 minutes. And then she looks over at me and she was like, would you like to get up now? 
because we had sat there for an hour right, and I'm yeah. like, see, this is what you look like trying to police somebody right. on a plane, trying to, trying to and spirit abide too. by rules. In spirit, it's like a bunch of child seats, like in the back seat of a, of a Miata. You know what I mean? Or yeah. the, the back of the Mazda, the small little compact car with the four doors, and then you got three uh, child seats in there. That's how tight those seats are. You have to plane. you have to debate with yourself. Would I like to wake up with a sharp pain in my neck, or do I want to sleep on this flight? Because there's no comfortable positions to sleep. Yeah, I'd have to do Spirit and buy the row. <laughs> but they don't let you do that either. No, no, they're like, no, we're gonna put somebody else in this thing. It's like, all right, I did try that one time. I didn't realize that if the person didn't check in, that they were just gonna give it to somebody else. Yeah, that happened, and I was very disappointed because yeah. I thought I bought two seats, and instead I was just out the money. Expensive lesson. Anyway, well, that was fun. So I want to talk today um, about opportunity. And you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday and um, it was funny because this had already been on my mind and you and I were having a conversation and then I ended up having a conversation with another guy uh, last night who used to work for us, who has gone on and started his own business and, you know, is doing well and trying to figure out next steps. And he was talking about some trials and stuff that they've been going through and dealing with. And, um, you know, the, the discussion we were having yesterday, Jonathan, was, you know, I said... <laughs> Where, where people mess up is they they work really hard. They have stuff that they're that they're doing. They have goals in mind, and they're doing the daily tasks necessary, like to to work towards those things, or to create what to create the opportunity that they need to to get to that next season of life or that next stage of what they're working towards, um, you know. And so it where I see so many people fail though is they've been working, working, working. The opportunity that they've been working for presents itself and they take advantage of the opportunity by making that next step. It's like, oh, this is what I've been working towards. Got that opportunity. And then they let off the gas and they stop. And it's like they treat the opportunity as the end result. Whereas the opportunity is just the start of the next phase. and I think when people get uh, different jobs, you know, they, they leave a job they've been at for a long time, been really successful at, maybe they didn't get the promotion they wanted, um, you know, or the transfer they wanted within the organization they're at. Someone else notices their skills and starts making phone calls and telling them how sexy they are and how smart they are and the impact they could have. And at the same time, you know, the company who's recruiting them is showing them a little leg, you know, and it, they're, they're being, they're doing all the things right, saying all the right things things enticing that person to to come over to their organization here is the opportunity and it's the opportunity you've worked for maybe it's a great opportunity maybe it's a bullshit opportunity but you you make that change and you're like this is the opportunity i have been waiting for and you jump and then it's like yeah i got that pay i got that title i've got that office I've got the, the status, but then they let off the gas and it's like that opportunity is just the next phase. It's the next part of the process because what they want, and I don't care whether it's work, whatever, relationally, it does not matter what you want when that opportunity creates itself is a part of it. And people act like what, what potentially comes by, by working, continuing to work and grow and develop once that opportunity arrives, it's so much further down the road, but people act like just getting the opportunity is it. Then they fail. Then they flounder, right? Think about it from a sports standpoint. Big name wide receiver, killing it for years. Maybe the team he's been with for years, they love him. I mean, he's, he's getting paid, but he's not getting paid, paid. Gets an opportunity from another team coming up the team has the money because it's always this way too the team with the money hasn't spent the money on other people on the team so the team who's usually got big money to spend doesn't have a bunch of other players around right that supporting cast and so side note those two warriors dudes pool and whoever uh, the Draymond. It, no, no no not the ones got in the fight um they both pool and this other dude they signed hundred 
plus million dollar three and four year contracts on the same day. And I just started cracking up. And the one dude signed like 102 million for another team. And they're like, yeah, he just wanted to stay with his team. He took below market. What I'm like, below market? These jokers, four year, 140 million, four year, 120 million, I think, deals. And I don't think either of them are starters. And I'm like, <laughs> like what? You know, the, the NBA is a different, a different beast. They give people like the small GDPs of countries to to play like ten minutes of basketball yeah, a night. It's wild. It's wild. I mean, good for the NBA. I mean, if they, that's the type of money they're generating, and you only got what twelve dudes on a team to to split it up. I mean, hey, that's great, whatever. But I'm sitting there looking at those numbers. But I was thinking about more with from a football standpoint because basketball, I feel like, is just talent. Talent, 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 but it's a smaller core group, right? Yeah. But you have that all-star player who leaves for that paycheck. How often would people say it's a bust? I feel like a lot. And I think a couple things come into play there. I think maybe the talent that he had around him to help him excel is no longer there. But I also think a big part of it is, and you see this across all industries, it's like, oh, man. I just got paid a contract for the next four or five years. I'm guaranteed a hundred million dollars. And all of a sudden, like it is hard to battle through that. Like I got to get up and still go to this gym. I need to be at these meetings on time. I need it. I made it. I'm set for life. My mom is set for life. My grandmother's set for life. About anybody who I care about in this world is set for life. Whether I break my back tomorrow or catch 80 touchdowns this year. We are set for life. No matter what, unless there's like a character issue, right? There's always these character clauses. And I think it's very difficult to stay disciplined on the things that you were doing day in and day out to get the opportunity to advance to that next step in that next level. That makes sense. You track with what I'm saying? Yeah, 100 percent. I think it has uh, a lot to do with what people see themselves as. At least I know with me, like pursuing a passion, it's really easy to say, like, I envision myself as this. And I think that the way that the world works, you know, we attach so much of who we are to what we make. So people will wait to say, like, I'm not this until I can sustain a living off yeah. of it. Um, and then once they get that living, I'm, now I'm a regional director of sales. Right. This is what I am. Yeah. And then they stay that and they stop working. So, yeah, because um, they found like that money piece that satisfies whatever it is. And it and it's a lot of security. You know, it's mm -hmm. like there's not a lot of desire to continue to work or continue to push yourself or put yourself outside of your boundaries when you know that you're secure. Yeah, but I would say that the the what people a lot of times often learn, though, is that. Aside from the guaranteed contracts example. Most people find false security Oh yeah. because if you don't do the work, if you don't, it's like, okay, I'm married. I've been married 15 years. I've got a couple kids, got the house, whatever, whatever. And this is me. This is an example because I've been married 20. Um, you know, it's, they stop investing in their spouses. They start, they stop dating their spouses. They stop doing the little things, hey, you know, how was your day? How are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on? What are you getting into today? I'm going to catch you later. Hey, you want to grab lunch? Like it, these things go away and stop and you have to make it a priority and you don't make it a priority like you did when you were dating, when you were on the hunt, right? Cause dudes are hunting and women aggressive as hell. Now they're hunting too. So everybody's out there hunting. And when you're hunting, you're aggressive and you're doing those extra things. You're going to, you're going to go up and, and look over that peak because you're still hunting, right? If, if you know that you've got the gazelle at the house that you done killed that morning, you're not going out looking for more because you're set. Now if that gazelle's not there. Now you got to go out and hunt again. And it's the same thing. Like when people are looking for you know, uh, affection when they're looking for a relationship or whatever, you're doing things that people stop doing once they feel secure in that relationship. And it's a false security. It's a false security because when you stop doing certain things, you know, it, it people are not instinctually going to look for something somewhere. And if a partner starts feeling not valued or appreciated, you know, it, the, 
they're going to find value in appreciation somewhere. Like it's just, it's how we're wired. It's who we are. And so you have to continue to work for it. It, it, you can't just bank on your wife being there when you get home, when you ignore, treat poorly and things like that and vice versa. You can't plan on that direct regional director of sales position to be there. And just cause you got the office and the company car and the plaques on the wall and the fat bonuses in the past that, that you can't have a false sense of security that that's going to be there next year for you. If you take your foot off the gas, so important, no matter what level you are, as you're moving through, whether it's personal or business related, you've got to keep doing the small things every day that got you to where you're going. We see it all the time in our business. Someone will get a promotion and, you know, and, and, you know, they're they're not leading people. Right. And I tell them every time, keep doing the things you were doing that got you here. That's what people need. They don't need a dictator. They don't need someone hollering at them. They don't need someone telling them what they screwed up all the time. They don't, they don't need that. If, if people are clear on what the expectations are and know what, what is needed, You either have the people who you can count on to do those things or you don't. And if you don't, you need to get different people in if you've coached well. Right. But if you, if you do have those people, then you don't need to be in there beating people's over the head. They know if they screwed up or not. How can we help you not do this again? What do you need from me? If you're that leader, you got to set that example and set that tone. That's why I like how, how we've set stuff up because we've screwed this up in the past plenty of times. And my hands are rarely on dogs. That's just not where we're at. And so I had to teach people, though, to be able to not police, but be invested with that team in a way that I don't get to be anymore because it's impossible. It's impossible. And it was really a lot of turmoil when I thought I was still able to do a good job of that. I didn't realize it till it was too late. I wasn't doing a good job of that. So now we've got smaller groups of people, you know, built up and they've got direct leadership and people. It's like, hey. Just keep doing what you've been doing and be a resource because doing what you're doing is going to allow you to progress. Doing what you're doing is setting the tone for everybody else who's coming up behind you that, man, if I just keep doing what I'm doing, doing a great job, operating with character and intensity and passion, it's going to lead to other opportunities. But, and then you just keep doing that when the opportunity arrives, the opportunity guys is not the end result. Once you get the opportunity, stop confusing yourself with that. Stop confusing yourself with this false sense of security. Like, oh, I took it. I got the opportunity. This is a big step for me. Look at my windfall or whatever it may be. And then stop. Don't do that. It's a false sense of security. Keep doing what you've done and learning and growing. Because that's going to prepare you for where you're going. Okay. It's you get that opportunity and I'm now content. Ah, I've made it. I got a bump in pay. This is the opportunity I needed. I made it. No, you're just comfortable for where you are, but is where you are, where you're trying to go, or is it just a stop along the path? Because stuff isn't going to be smooth. There's going to be problems. You're going to have pressure and stress. And if you're not and things, everything's smooth and great and gravy, that's just because you're comfortable for where you're at. And I ask you is where you're at, where you're trying to go. Is where you're at, where you're trying to go, or is it just a stop along the way? Got to pay attention to that. All right. These opportunities don't get it twisted. Don't get hung up. Like the opportunity is the end. The opportunity is the start. Stay focused on what your passion is. Stay focused on the vision that you had that created that opportunity in the first place and keep, keep plugging away. Appreciate y'all. I missed you. Um, hated not being in the studio, but we're back and, um, we got some good stuff coming up. It's fall y'all. We'll see you soon.